Tonight, an E. coli outbreak at daycare sends dozens of young children to hospital. We just want answers. You know, these are our children and they are really suffering. The dangerous bacteria and how it was allowed to spread so widely. Leaders of the truck convoy protests are now on trial. Do you think of the use of the word occupation by the Crown? I think I'm just going to have a cigarette. <laughs> Why prosecutors argue they took protests too far. And car thefts in Canada are way up. So where do those vehicles end up? This is stolen from Canada. A CBC News investigation tracks them overseas. I'm sitting in your once stolen vehicle in West Africa. No way. Yeah. We break down what's being done to derail these criminal networks. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Hospitals in Calgary tonight are dealing with a flood of incredibly sick young children. Parents rushing their toddlers and preschoolers to the emergency room following an E. coli outbreak at their daycares. At least 50 children have arrived in hospital with awful symptoms like bloody diarrhea. 15 were admitted. Alberta Health Services suspects the outbreak is linked to a central kitchen shared by as many as 11 child care centres. As Carolyn Dunn tells us, this has left parents demanding answers. For days, Sarah McDonald has been keeping watch over her four-year-old son in hospital. Lachlan is one of dozens of children who have tested positive for a strain of E. coli infection that is making them very ill. This diarrhea was so intense, it's like nothing I've ever seen and I knew something was really, really wrong. He just said, Mommy, why can't you help me? And this broke my heart, you know, the, I found myself, you know, on the floor of my bathroom just praying, somebody help me. Public health officials believe the shared kitchen servicing six fueling brains daycare centers and five other facilities is the source of the infection. Parents have been told all children and staff will be tested for E. coli and the daycares have been closed. In a statement to the Canadian press, fueling brains said it would be deep cleaning its facilities. Its vice president, Lois Garcia, said her deepest concerns and empathy are with everyone impacted by the outbreak. More than 50 young children from those daycares have been flooding Calgary emergency rooms since late last week, some as young as two years old. Sometimes there's an E. coli that circulates that's called uh, shiga toxin producing E. coli, often referred to as STEC. Now this is a problem. Lab tests show they were positive for shiga toxin, a bacteria that is found in undercooked or raw meat, some vegetables and unpasteurized milk and juice. Those infected suffer from bloody stool, severe diarrhea and other gastrointestinal issues. There's also a danger of even more serious complications. So they can develop kidney failure, anemia, so their red blood cells can break down and they can actually have other complications such as seizures as well that can occur in the five to 10 days after the onset of symptoms. Now, in addition to looking after her son, Sarah McDonald is waiting. We just want answers, you know, these are our children and they are really suffering. Carolyn, many of those children are being treated right there at the Children's Hospital behind you. What is the advice that Alberta Health is giving parents? Well, Alberta Health Services is telling anyone exhibiting symptoms that they should get medical help immediately. It's also important to note that this strain of E. coli is transmissible from person to person without proper hygiene. So experts say diligent hand washing is essential, particularly after a bowel movement or a diaper change. All right, thank you. That's Carolyn Dunn. Ontario's premier says his government will review the way it opened up thousands of hectares of protected land known as the Green Belt for development. This just a day after the minister responsible resigned. But as Jamie Strachan shows us, this hasn't stopped the political outcry. Well, good morning. Doug Ford's government has been dogged by the Green Belt controversy for weeks. Now, this. There's going to be a complete review from top to bottom. Ford has promised to review and evaluate all protected lands around the Toronto area known as the Green Belt, including the 14 pieces already released to developers. A review, he insists, would have happened anyway. We acknowledge the process wasn't up to snuff by, by any means. We're going to review them. We're going to make sure 
they stand with their merit, and that's what we're going to look at. The review won't pause planned housing development on those 14 properties. The people of Ontario are angry. They want the government to return the land to the Greenbelt. They know it was a dirty deal. We need to see the emails, we need to see the texts, we need to see the phone records. And we need to have a legislative committee be able to interview all those involved. This story has already left considerable political damage. Lands from the Green Belt. Two scathing reports from the Auditor General and the Integrity Commissioner found the former Chief of Staff to the Housing Minister favoured certain developers. He's since resigned, as did Ford's Housing Minister Steve Clark. The matter has been referred to the RCMP. I think Premier Ford wants to stop talking about the process and stop talking about ministers and stop talking about all of this stuff that may or may not have gone wrong. Ford has deflected controversy by continuously pointing to the province's housing shortage as the reason for building on the Greenbelt, a strategy that this pollster says may be working. The public at the moment is very much more concerned about access to housing than they are about issues related to the environment or climate change. Still, he says this file has the government on its heels, desperately trying to rewrite the narrative. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Doug Ford also had some strong words for the Bank of Canada, asking it to stop hiking interest rates. If we don't see the stop, people will lose their homes. They're struggling. Ford says the speed at which they've jumped 10 times within 18 months makes it nearly impossible for families to get by. He is joining BC Premier David Eby and Newfoundland and Labrador Premier Andrew Fury. Both have written to the bank making the same plea. The bank will announce its decision tomorrow. And tomorrow also brings day two of a high-profile trial in Ottawa. Two organizers of the truck convoy protest face multiple charges. As Rafi Bujikanian tells us, the prosecution is arguing the trial isn't about political views, it's about the means used to express them. Tuesday's court appearances for Chris Barber and Tamara Leach far quieter than the events that made them famous in Ottawa. Hold the line! Hold the line! Freedom! Leach and Barber each accused of mischief, intimidation and obstruction related charges after they helped organize the convoy that shut down the national capital for three weeks early last year. The stated goal was to end pandemic related public health restrictions, though some players also sought to topple the federal government. Police largely watched until the government resorted to the Emergencies Act, granting officials extra powers like freezing financial assets and removing vehicles. Leach and Barber were arrested. As the accused sat in court, the prosecution described those three weeks as an occupation. Leach offered no opinion about that. What do you think of the use of the word occupation by the Crown? I think I'm just going to have a cigarette. <laughs> But her lawyer said this. When there are Ukrainians under, our, under real occupation. It's an insult to them and anybody else who survived an occupation. Some observers say rejecting the term may be part of a strategy. If you're talking about an illegal occupation, you're basically starting from the get-go that anything that you might say would be construed as encouraging people to carry on with illegal activity within an illegal occupation. The trial is expected to last just a little over two weeks. The Crown intends to call at least 22 witnesses, some of them downtown residents who got an injunction against the truckers' bullhorns last year. The defence arguing the latter voices are unnecessary. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. An Ontario man accused of running down a Muslim family has pleaded not guilty to murder charges. Nathaniel Veltman entered those pleas in a Windsor courtroom even though the fatal incident happened in London, Ontario. In June of 2021, the Afzal family was struck by a vehicle during an evening walk. Four were killed, including a 15-year-old girl. A nine-year-old boy survived. Prosecutors allege Veltman was motivated by anti-Muslim hate. In just hours, residents of Yellowknife will get to go home. An evacuation order is set to lift at noon Wednesday. It's been nearly three weeks since a wildfire forced some 20,000 residents to flee. Many went south into Alberta to stay in Calgary and Edmonton, and now they're starting to make the long drive back. The last stop before Yellowknife is the hamlet of Fort Providence. That's where Juanita Taylor is tonight. Oh, just about out of dish soap, time to go home.
This is the last day this Yellowknifer will be doing dishes at a campground, where she's taken refuge for nearly three weeks. It's time. It is way past time to leave. More than 20,000 residents were ordered to evacuate the city and neighboring Detta and Dilo because of a wildfire. By morning, they can finally head home. We're really hoping that we don't get trapped in some kind of convoy, you know, like, you know, people, antsy drivers and, you know, all of that stuff. Like, we're hoping that it's going to be a, a reasonable drive home. Okay, you're good. Okay. Essential workers have been allowed back, and there is anticipation of the swaths of people in vehicles stopping here in Fort Providence, south of Yellowknife. I'm anxious to see my house. I don't know what it looks like, and uh, but I'm, I'm happy to be going back. I'm excited. <laughs> I want to sleep in my own bed. You know, compact your chocolate bars and put them together so that you have room for what's coming in. This is the last major gas station before driving the last 315 kilometers to Yellowknife. Its pump stopped working earlier Tuesday when a transport truck hit power poles. But crews were brought in to fix the problem just in time for people needing gas Wednesday. We're pleasant, that we're welcoming, that people know we're here. Um, and I've always said, you don't have to buy anything. Come in, use the bathroom, sit down, have a talk, have a rest. And highway crews will be managing all that traffic. About six vehicles together going over until I get to the top and then I'm sending another six. The mayor of Fort Providence says his community has hosted 150 evacuees. A lot of people just want to help people and they enjoy doing it. And Juanita, we know that wildfire is still burning some 15 kilometers from Yellowknife. Could that derail these plants? Well, Adrian officials say that fire isn't at risk of spreading, so it shouldn't put anyone in danger crossing that checkpoint starting at 12 p.m. local time tomorrow. And we've heard from Yellowknife's mayor, who says the outskirts of the city will look different because of a 100-meter fire break crews have constructed. And Adrian, residents tell me they worry about what they will see when they get back because the landscape may be really scarred. A new reality to be sure. Juanita Taylor tonight in a very buggy Fort Providence. Justin Trudeau is in Indonesia tonight looking to strengthen trade with Southeast Asia. So Canada will be opening an export development office in Jakarta to help Canadian businesses enter new markets in the region. Indonesia is the region's largest economy. And tomorrow the Prime Minister will address the ASEAN Summit, a group of 10 Southeast Asian countries. And I'm happy to say that the writ has officially been dropped. And with that, a provincial election is underway in Manitoba. PC leader Heather Stephenson is looking for the party's third consecutive majority as Manitobans head to the polls next month. She could face a challenge from the opposition NDP. Health care and the cost of living are shaping up as big issues. The election is set for October the 3rd. And a community in Pennsylvania is on edge tonight. A convicted murderer has been on the lam ever since he escaped from a prison nearly a week ago. And as Paul Hunter explains, the man is proving so elusive, law enforcement is using some unusual methods to catch him. Somewhere out there in the thick woods and outlying suburbs west of Philadelphia, a convicted killer, now prison escapee, is on the run. He's a bad guy, he needs to be in custody, and we're determined to capture him. Somehow, Danilo Cavalcante escaped custody nearly a week ago. Considered dangerous and desperate, police aren't saying how he made it out. They themselves are under fierce pressure to now recapture him, even resorting to an unusual tactic. Listen carefully. <laughs> An audio message blaring from that helicopter in Portuguese from Cavalcante's own mother. As desperate as he is, maybe he has a change of thought and here's his mother telling him to surrender and his family cares about him. He's desperate, he's hungry, he's been in the woods, he's dirty. Perhaps this is what puts him over the edge where we can get a peaceful surrender. That said, it's not as if Cavalcante has gone unseen. Security cameras have caught glimpses of him multiple times. A state trooper even saw him in person and gave chase, but lost him. A local homeowner believes he heard Cavalcante rummaging downstairs in his house Friday night.
I woke up my wife, I said, hey, I think there might be somebody downstairs. Um, you know, get, get on the phone. Whoever it was took some food and fled. He'll make mistakes. He'll show himself. We'll contain him and we will eventually catch him. But when? Police have said he was last seen headed north and then south. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. For many students across this country, today was the first day back to school. Three, two. <laughs> Off to their new classrooms they go, and for some students in Ontario, they'll have to do that in sweltering heat. Temperatures reaching more than 30 degrees. In Quebec, the heat in some areas was so intense, authorities had to close down 23 schools. And in Russia, students are getting an entirely new curriculum, one that reflects the Kremlin's narrative around the war in Ukraine. Briar Stewart shows us how some are buying into it and others are pushing back. The start of the school year in Russia is full of ceremony, and it now includes a curriculum designed to drill into students the Kremlin talking points and a love for the military. Teenagers now receive basic military training, which includes first aid. And President Vladimir Putin turned up to give a special lesson. We were absolutely invincible, he said, and still are. This year, a new history textbook reinforces what Russia sees as its righteous military operation in Ukraine. The new textbook contains very vivid examples of courage and heroism, says this teacher. Teachers are in terror. Tamara Edelman described the book as poisonous. She won't be teaching it because she's now living in exile, where she gives history lectures. It puts together all terrible ideas that Russian propaganda has been using for the last several years. In classrooms, Russian patriotism is on full display. Desks are set aside to honor those killed in Ukraine. We aren't identifying this teacher for her own safety as she still works in Russia and covertly tries to have honest discussions about the war. And if I feel uncertain about some of the students, I will never start such a talk. Because many do support what the Kremlin is doing. These textbooks reflect the real truth, says this woman. The educational push is strongest in areas that Russia has illegally taken over, like Mariupol, where the Kremlin is trying to convince an entire community that a violent invasion was just and people should be grateful. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Some British Columbia communities are seeing an influx of unwanted visitors. The best thing we can do to protect bears and to help people be safer is to manage those attractants. Why black bears are coming to town in record numbers, next. Cars stolen from Canadians and shipped halfway around the world. I'm pretty sure I'm sitting in your once stolen vehicle in West Africa. No way. Yeah. David Common on the trail of the thieves in a CBC News investigation. And later, one man's labor of love. I never dreamt when I started first I'd ever get to $100,000. The village built for a good cause, one bottle at a time. We're back to two. A city in northern BC is seeing some new unwelcome visitors, black bears. It has gotten to the point where the RCMP has asked people to stop calling in bear sightings. Lindsay Duncombe explains what seems to be causing these close encounters. This sanctuary for orphaned bear cubs is expecting a busy year. It's going to get really bad. The, um, the need will be humongous. Cubs here have been abandoned by their mothers, attacked by dogs, even caught in wildfire. This female is recovering from burned paws. So whether it's a fire or the drought that's driving them out doesn't really make any difference. But for us, it means that province-wide, bears are in trouble. There's three of them. They're climbing the tree. 
Biologists don't know exactly what's happening to northern BC's black bear population, but in Prince George, many are coming closer to humans. It could be because their habitat has burned or because drought has dried up their food sources. We're in kind of an unprecedented time here, and we're sitting, it's, yeah, we're just run off our feet essentially. RCMP have told people to stop calling unless a bear is being aggressive. If people are in danger, then we'll respond rapidly. But um, other than that, we just kind of have to let these animals live their lives. We're in their territory as much as they're in ours. In August, conservation officers put down 36 bears for safety reasons. Compare that to last year when no bears were killed. Anytime that people are interacting with bears, it just increases the possibility or the percentage of bears who may end up getting killed um, because of those interactions. They're distinctive. They have distinctive Advocates colors. say Black protect bear the bears really by getting rid of any food, pick fruit trees, clean up garbage. There are still weeks until hibernation. Close encounters are expected to continue. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Companies across the country are starting to demand workers come back to the office. You have to be on site. You have to be on site. We need you on site. Will employees return to work or look for new jobs? Plus, a CBC News exclusive investigation. Canadian cars being stolen at staggering rates. How many Canadian cars have you seized that are just in this lot? Um... For the two months, I think we've seized more than 40 cards. David Common tracks them down on another continent. The breakdown on car thefts, next. At least two people have died and two others are missing after a weekend of torrential rain. Near the Spanish capital, heavy flooding tore down bridges, tossed cars, and severely damaged homes. Some dramatic street scenes saw rescuers using ropes and rubber boats to get people out, including a 10-year-old boy who'd clung to a tree overnight. And a second day of flooding in Greece has caused at least one death when a crumbling wall fell on a man trying to reach his livestock. The surging water swept away people's belongings, even vehicles. More rain fell in a 24-hour period than has ever happened since records have been kept there. That comes after weeks of scorching heat and wildfires. Well, your morning commute here may seem more congested now that more and more companies are putting constraints on working from home. Nisha Patel shows us why they think it's a must and why some workers are pushing back. This Vancouver office looks like a ghost town. The boss says it's time for that to change. We're missing the ability for people to connect, to solve problems faster, to run into each other. Starting next week, he's implementing Together Tuesdays, one day when all staff must be in the office. Being together at some point over some period of time is valuable and important to an organization. The pandemic forced a lot of workers to clock in from home, but more than three years later, many are still avoiding the office. Now some companies are taking a stricter tone, saying showing up in person is mandatory. You have to be on site. You have to be on site. We need you on site. With a young son in school, Shama Kumar found going into the office five days a week too stressful. So she quit and found a new job offering hybrid work. When I realized that this company doesn't really meet my needs, my family needs, um, I had to make the change. Do this. Although the job market is a little cooler these days, experts say workers have options and will exercise that power. Once employees have had an opportunity for work from home, they're going to continue to expect to be allowed to do that in the future. Still, businesses from J.P. Morgan to Meta are ordering staff back to their desks. Even Zoom, the video call company that's the face of remote work, is moving to a hybrid model. Amazon workers are protesting similar mandates, but the tech giant is upping the stakes, hinting that those who don't show up may find themselves out of a job. The issue is that that's not a good way to manage your employees because your best people could be the ones who leave. Amanda Nilsson left an employer that wanted her to return in person. She says she's more productive at home and it allows her time to exercise, travel and take on new hobbies. The quality of my life had improved so much over the last three years of remote work that um, I, I just I wasn't ready to give that up. So companies pushing for workers to come into the office 
should prepare for workers to push back. Shoulder shrugs. Nisha Patel, CDC News, Toronto. Now, every show, this is the moment when the National goes right to the heart of the stories Canadians are talking about. And tonight, we're tracking down what happens to stolen Canadian cars after the thieves drive away. So, let's get going. This is The Breakdown. Four, seven, about one, we chase down vehicles go. stolen from Canada that end up in West Africa. Okay, this is wild. There's a car with a Quebec license plate on the road. The owners of stolen cars are stunned by the lengths we've gone to. We have been to the dealership that your car was last seen at. And they wonder why Canada has let things get so bad. From Canadian driveways to the streets of Ghana, David Common breaks down the workings of a vast criminal network that seems to see this country as a target ripe for the picking. There we go. Here's an ownership. North York, Ontario. We're in West Africa. Yep, how could I see? There's the original Quebec license plate. Every one of these vehicles ripped off and shipped down. All right, this is stolen from? Canada. From Canada? Yes. Ending up sold abroad in places like Ghana. And how many Canadian cars have you seized that are just in this lot? Um, for the two months, I think we've seized more than 40 cars. There are clues to the original owners, from stickers to a snow brush. Oh, even better. Canadian flag. And in one car, a phone number for the original owner, Len Green of Toronto. I'm gonna phone him. Might be too early for a phone call, or maybe looking at a number they don't recognize. Hello? Hi, is that Leonard? Yeah. Leonard, this is gonna sound like a really weird call. Um, my name is David Common. I'm calling from CBC News. We're doing an investigation into stolen vehicles. And I'm pretty sure I'm sitting in your once stolen vehicle in West Africa. Really? Yeah, I'm in West Africa. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you mind if I FaceTime you? Uh, I don't mind at all. This uh, look like your car? <laughs> That's it. That's it. It was stolen um, September, October of last year. And what happened? So we were going out that day in the morning. My wife went out to get in the car and uh, it wasn't in the driveway. When we checked the camera, the video from the camera from the ring uh, doorbell, at about three in the morning, you see a car and two guys pull up towards the driveway. And about four minutes later, the light goes off. They're gone, the car's gone from the driveway. I know this is probably not the call you expected today, but your ownership is still in the glove box. Um, here's your car. There's a car that still has a New Jersey license plate on it. The car stolen from North York over there. I can't believe it. And, and my documents and everything are still in there. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Crazy indeed, but Len is hardly alone. Eastbound 47, about 190, 200. Auto theft in Canada has never been this bad. High speed chases, home invasions, violent carjackings, but rarely do the bad guys get caught. Last year, they stole 27,000 cars from the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area alone, one every 17 minutes. A large portion of them are actually leaving the country. You'll see about 80% of them uh, going out through the ports. Detective Mark Haywood of Peel Regional Police is one of Canada's foremost specialists on theft for export. Uh, much easier to sell 15 cars on the black market than it is to sell 15 keys of cocaine or 15 illegal guns. And they're seeing that profitability. Just how big? Deputy Chief Nick Milinovic. Last year in 2022, there was over a billion dollars worth of vehicles uh, that were stolen across Canada. And it's now one of the top three uh, funders of organized crime. So it's big business, big profit for them. Huge, huge. 
This was the spot it was stolen from? In yes, Oakville, correct. Ontario. It was parked right here. We arrived home from Greg and Lynn Gannett became the just the, the latest here. of their neighbors to be targeted. Uh, we walked outside and, and the car was not there. They just drove it away, basically. Like it was it was amazing actually how quickly they were able to steal it. So smoothly, the thieves only barely triggered this motion capture camera. When police arrived, they told them the car is gone forever. It's probably already on its, its way to Montreal, yeah. <laughs> going to Africa or some other foreign country. Yeah. After a steal, thieves move cars quickly to shipping containers where GPS tracking is muffled, then placed on tractor trailers or rail lines to the port of Montreal. What countries are those cars ending up in? Several. We're seeing a lot of them go to the UAE, to Dubai. There's uh, Nigeria is a hotbed for that. Ghana is another place that they're showing up in. It's scary and increasingly violent. But we've come to Greg and Lynn because of a because stunning of discovery. Um, we think we found your car. Wow. We believe we've found your car located in the West African nation of Ghana. Wow. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> and uh, it's for sale. Oh, well, isn't that interesting? So here's the next thing. We're gonna actually try to see your car Oh, wow. <laughs> We're going to go to Ghana. Excellent. It is a long journey into a world full of snatched cars. This vehicle reported stolen in Ontario. The stolen from Saint Laurent, Quebec, Ottawa, Ontario in 2023. This vehicle stolen in Ontario. Cars seized by Ghana's economic and organized crime office. We are doing all that we can to ensure that at least, if not to eradicate all, we can actually bring it to the barest minimum. Alex Lindsay runs surveillance for the office. Even he admits all this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think the Canadian courts need to be more proactive in trying to stop it before even it gets down here. Okay, this is wild. We're just driving along through traffic. There's a car with a Quebec license plate on the road in front of the organized crime authorities, just driving along. That car bails from traffic, quite possibly a new arrival. Just take a look as we slow drive past all the used car dealers. Is it very likely these vehicles we're seeing are still yes. like, they, they are? Yes. They are. Okay. Yes. Indeed, Lexus, Honda, Dodge Rams, Toyota, some of the most stolen vehicles in Canada now here for sale openly. Even law enforcement has to be careful. We have issued threats to officers that the next time probably we come to retrieve cars, they are going to um, um, fight. So we have us. to be very careful driving So we by. have to be very careful. Back at headquarters, we sit down with the office's deputy director. We do encounter some few resistance. Abdullah Bashiru Dabila tells us how they know which vehicles to seize based on intelligence from the FBI. So the situation we have with respect to these vehicles is such that, yes, we are collaborating with the FBI. The FBI has uh, given us evidence that the vehicles were stolen from Canada and then the United States. Dapila says he needs Canada to step up to stop the flow in the first place. It sounds to me like Canadian law enforcement, in your mind, could be doing a lot more. Yes. No Canadian agency, except, except through the FBI, has approached us directly or made a formal complaint to us directly. We've tracked Lynn and Greg's car to this lot in Ghana, and we're going looking for it. We understand that there was a vehicle that was reported stolen from Canada that ended up at this dealership, at this lot. Hey. The workers get agitated quickly. Do you sell stolen vehicles here? But the lot is full of the most stolen vehicle types in Canada. Do you mind if I look at the VIN numbers and just see? Uh... They push back and approach our camera operator. Why are you taking pictures of the place? I'm filming my journalist. No. You don't, you don't have the right to take the pictures here. Because, like, if I look at this Acura, like, this is the kind of damage that happens when they put them in shipping containers when they're stolen. So do you mind if I look at the, the VIN? We've been warned this is risky, so we head out to call up Lynn and Greg. 
kind of suspicious. Okay, we have been to the dealership that your car was last seen at. And guess what? It's not there anymore. Um, it appears they may have sold it. It's incredible to us that, that you are where you are at the lot where you, you know you tracked us from the car from Ontario across across the, you know the world to Ghana. Next, we go inside the fight to stop cars from being stolen. We've just retrieved one of those vehicles back from them. We've caused the disruption, and uh, that's the goal. This ship has just come into port in Montreal, loaded with stolen cars being returned to Canada intercepted by authorities in Malta halfway through their voyage. Our investigators, they will cut that shortly. The Range Rover by Land Rover is the first vehicle. The shopping list of the most stolen vehicles. Looks like they've taken care and it's in good shape. Again, really, Push button start, SUV or pickup truck are really the targeted vehicles and that's the theme that we're seeing here as well. Investigator Brian Gast works with the Equite Association. It works to reduce the massive claims member insurance companies now face from ballooning auto theft. The first thing that comes to my mind the crisis that's happening in Ontario and Quebec is we've just retrieved one of those vehicles back from them. We've caused the disruption, and uh, that's the goal. Plus, there are clues here. Out of the shipping containers, vehicles get a more forensic examination. So we're just looking at any of the damage that they, uh, they, they made to steal the vehicle, looking to see how the, the vehicle was stolen. This was an onboard diagnostic port attack, or OBD. They remove that part to get access to the computer of the vehicle to reprogram the key. So it's a reprogramming theft. And then we have uh, relay attacks where you have somebody at the front uh, doorbell or your front of your residence what, with what looks to be an antenna. They're trying to intercept the re radio frequency between that key fob and the vehicle. Okay. So how many times has your car been stolen? Three times. Over how long? We originally okay. met Natalie Cara after the and first theft. It. Here it is, a suspected relay attack in her driveway at home. The car was recovered thanks to a GPS system on board. Months later, she looked out the window at work. Here. Here. Yeah. And you're, you're watching them steal yeah. your car from that window. Yeah, correct. She told Three me, men, one getaway car, car, and Natalie and confronts looking, them. I'm, I'm looking and I'm like, no! <laughs> and I'm coming out and yelling at them. I'm, I'm like, what are you guys doing? And uh, they got afraid. So one of the guy went into the car and I was face to face like you and I. Like this close. This close, even closer. <laughs> And then I said, and all hood, black jeans, hood, and then the mask. And then he said, sorry, he said, sorry, jumped in the car, and then off they went. Looking at the damage, this is the newest form of theft. Under that damaged wheel well is the CAN bus. Thieves connect to a port there and can quickly unlock and start the car. It's a weak point. Yeah. And I asked Lexus what they're doing about this, and they're working on it. We hear that from a lot of automakers. Yeah, yeah. they're working on it. Well, Natalie's story isn't over yet. She brings her car here for repairs, but her in-car GPS system then alerts her the car's on the move. And an hour later, I got the manager of Lexus calling me and saying, you know, your car got stolen overnight. But it's this car yeah. it's recovered again. Thanks to the GPS system, the thieves failed to deactivate. 
you right. know, the reward's very high and the risk is very low. We have anecdotal stories of people who have stolen cars, walked out of court and stolen another car in the same parking lot. So, you know, the, the risk there is not what it needs to be. How good a job do we do in Canada combating auto theft? I don't think we do a very good job. Michael Rotha represents leasing and finance companies who are urging widespread action now. In the last five years, there's been a 300% increase in auto theft in the GTA. 300%? 300%. What's going on? From our perspective, it's a lack of enforcement. He wants Canada's antiquated system of tracking exports improved, plus far more inspections of containers leaving ports. And then obviously resourcing Canada Border Services so they have more agents. In some ports they have maybe one or two people that are tasked with this and also more scanners for the containers as they go out. We've become a, a, a global donor in stolen vehicles. When you compare certain brands, there's more cars being stolen in, in Canada than there are being in the U.S. Given that they're 10 times the size, that gives you the sense of the, the magnitude of this issue. There is an element for industry the auto industry to play in the issue of auto thefts. Making like, it harder to steal. Absolutely. I think consumers really need to do their due diligence. Uh, vote with your dollars is a very, very simple concept, right? We look at safety ratings, we look at performance stats, we look at, you know, the style of vehicle. Included in that conversation should be uh, the security of that vehicle and your ability to prevent it being stolen. So David, it, it surely seems like there's a lot of stolen Canadian property overseas. What are the chances of getting it back? Well, Adrian, getting cars back is actually a real challenge. So if you think about those vehicles that we saw in Montreal, they were still in containers when authorities in Malta found them and turned them around back to Canada, part of an intelligence sharing network that we have there. But when it comes to West Africa, it's a totally different story. So in Ghana, someone would actually have to put those vehicles into a container, get them to a port, get them on the ship and send them to Canada. Who's going to pay for that? The insurance companies own the vehicles, but is it financially worth it? Not always. Then there's the question of just connections. Canada does not have the pull that it might need to get vehicles back. So the Equité Association, for instance, has been trying to get back dozens of vehicles from Nigeria for more than a year. No luck. All right, that's David Common breaking it down for us. Coming up, a passion project for a good cause. The biggest one, the sports center, it's got 4,200 bottles plus in it. Step inside Hannah's Bottle Village in our moment. Well, this next story is a labor of love more than 20 years in the making. Gare Gillis of PEI has built an entire village using over 28,000 glass bottles. So it's become quite a tourist attraction. And this weekend, he surpassed $100,000 in donations, every cent going to the IWK Foundation. That's a charity focused on women and children's health. His generosity is our moment. I'd never dreamt when I started first I'd ever get to $100,000. Now Saturday morning we're gonna pass 100,000 and then I'm gonna set the bar at 150,000. And maybe when I get there, 200,000, who knows? I started in 2002, church. And if you look here, you can see a cross in the back wall there. See it there? Then the store the next year, then the schoolhouse the year after. Named after our oldest grandson, Cameron Allen Davies. At that time, people would be stopping in and suggest that I should open for a business. But I said, what better place to fundraise than for the IWK? Because it gives a lot of kids a second chance at life. So why not? And every cent goes to them. The biggest one, the, the sports center, it's got 4,200 bottles plus in it. Oh, it's a hockey rig. And I've used 28,000 bottles, okay? Since, and I never drank one. I got to add that to it, because I've been sober for 47 years. When I leave this world, I, I'll have a good feel that I've done something good, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he sure did. So uh, Gary says he will do this for the rest of his life. And by the way, in that sports center, you might have seen a lot of Montreal Canadiens logos. He says it will only be Canadians. Do not ask him for the Maple Leafs logo. Won't ever happen. Thank you for watching us. To watch anytime, you can download the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.